Let's open with a prayer. Let us pray. God, you are the God of angel armies, and you are always by our side, and we pray now that you're by our side as we continue on on the Roman road together, as we continue exploring Paul's letter to the Roman church. Startle us by your Holy Spirit. Awaken us to your promises and your living word, the true light of the world, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us hear the word of God as it is written in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 9. We continue our sermon series. Verses 1 through 5. Paul wrote, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll call her Jenny. Jenny was uh, a beautiful woman who grew up in an affluent neighborhood. She was very smart. She exercised regularly. She took care of herself. She dressed well. But she had this one problem that kept her stuck in her life. For some reason, Jenny was afraid, lonely, and depressed. She needed love in her life. She needed someone to love her. How is it that such a beautiful woman, such as Jenny, could not attract a man to love her in her life? Well, apparently, Jenny had experienced a lot of rejection growing up as a little girl. She spoke of the pain of rejection, of not being chosen to dance on the dance floor with all the handsome guys of not being chosen to play on the winning team with her friends, a feeling left out, excluded. She remembers being called hurtful names. She remembers feeling worthless, feeling bad about her self-identity, feeling heartbroken. A lot of research supports the fact that how we see ourselves greatly impacts how we behave and act in the world and in our relationships. On the one hand, if we believe we are a victim, then we're going to let others victimize us. On the other hand, if we believe we're confident, then we'll act in confident ways. Our beliefs about ourselves determine our behavior. In this case, Jenny believed that she was rejected in her life, and she was heartbroken. In verse 1 of our scripture lesson, Paul's heart is heartbroken over the Israelites' rejection of Jesus Christ. So what now? Should Paul just simply write them off? By no means. They are of his flesh and blood. He could not turn his back on them now. We know that dear and near to Paul's heart was the belief that nothing could separate him from the love of God and Jesus Christ. But if somehow Paul could persuade or conjole or encourage, save his brethren, he would. And he would also gladly accept being cut off, anathema from Christ. There's no question in Paul's thinking that the Israelites are definitely part of God's sovereign plan of salvation and thus the recipient of many privileges. According to Paul, 
you look in the scripture passage in verse 4, the first and primary privilege that belongs to the Israelites is that they are adopted into God's family. Paul is the only writer in the New Testament who really reflects on the subject of or the theme of adoption. So what does it mean to the Apostle Paul? The Greek word for adoption is hoiothesia. And the word hoiothesia is made up of two words, huios, which means son, and thesis, which means placing. Hoiothesia, or adoption, is the process or act of being placed into God's family. In Paul's day, adoption was a family term that in the ancient world describes the Roman socio-legal act of adoption with all its implications. While today, in the Western culture, anytime we hear someone talking about adoption, it's usually focused on a baby. In the Roman culture, adoption focused more on adults, and it was widespread. Adoption was a means by which succession to power, excuse me, was brought about. During Christ's lifetime and even after his death, the legal and political acceptance and ramification of adoption was played out at the highest level of the Roman government, adoption secured the lineage of the ruling family of Rome. Literally, the adoptee was taken out of an old relationship with his father and brought to a new rela relationship with his new father. All of his old debts were canceled. And in effect, the adoptee started a new life with his new family. At the time of the writing of this letter to the church in Rome, and I'll bet specifically in chapter 9, Paul's already talked some on adoption earlier in chapter 8. Paul would have known about this process. He would have been very familiar with it. So Paul understands the Israelites having been adopted by God into God's family. But what about the Gentiles? Remember, part of Paul's purpose in writing this letter to the Roman church was namely to address the division of the Jews and the Gentiles. And the situation was that separate house churches were divided among ethnic lines, and each of these churches were worshiping in different parts of Rome. So through this strategic use of adoption in verse 4, Paul is stressing the need for inclusion for acceptance, for welcome, e equality, and inclusion between the Jews and the Gentiles and the shared honor of being members of God's family. If our beliefs about ourselves determine our behavior and our actions, then we need to look at ourselves from a new perspective, one that's centered and rooted in Jesus Christ through being adopted in God's family. The Apostle Paul wants us to know that God not only had an eternal, sovereign, saving, electing purpose for each of us, but God took great delight and joy in adopting us into his family. Through Christ's incarnation, his life, his death on the cross, and finally his body, bodily resurrection from the grave. Our adoption centers first and foremost on a relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, adoption is not only a great way to describe our salvation, it's also the most intimate personal term to describe our relationship with God. So who is this God to whom we belong? In the book of Confessions of the PCUSA is the brief statement of faith. And the brief statement of faith says, In life and death, we belong to God. Through the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. I like that phrase. In life and death, we belong to God. 
In just a few days, Epiphany begins. The season of Epiphany. What does Epiphany mean? Well, we're, we're rejoice, rejoicing uh, over Christ's uh, being born. The light shining in the darkness. But also to call forth uh, Christ, to make Jesus Christ visible in the world as God's true light. Simply put, Epiphany celebrates the ongoing work of Christmas. In life and death, we belong to God. God adopted us into his family. We didn't find God. God chose to find us, and God loves us so much that he brought us out of the darkness of our sin and death into the marvelous and glorious light of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We are God's children chosen by God and adopted into his family for one purpose that we'll grow into the image of Jesus Christ. So if Paul tells us that we're adopted into God's family in and through Jesus Christ, then how do we describe this identity? How do we know what this means? Well, in the first letter of Peter, we hear these words, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. A chosen race. As God's adopted children, we are acceptable, God says, in Christ. I like how Eugene Peterson puts it in his message on verse 9. He says, you are chosen by God from rejected to accepted. Deep in all our hearts, we all seek acceptance. In a world filled with division and brokenness, we seek acceptance from everyone, from our parents, from our children, from our friends, aunts, and uncles, and even strangers on the street. Why do we seek acceptance? Because we want to be chosen. In Christ, God chooses us just as we are. Through God's amazing grace and love in Jesus Christ, we are invited and welcomed into God's family, no matter who we are or what is happening into our life. A people for his own possession. As God's adopted children, God says we are valuable in Christ. How are we valuable in Christ? Who determines our value? God determines our value. God determines how much we are worth. In Christ, God showed us how valuable we are by sending his son to become flesh. Live among us, die on the cross for our sins, and rise from the grave. The cross proves how valuable we are to God. Jesus purchased us with this life. Christ owns us. We are valuable in his sight. A royal priesthood. God says we are chosen to serve. So at the beginning of the new year, on the cusp of Epiphany, have you ever thought of yourself as a priest? Anybody? Have you ever thought of yourself as a priest? Every person who is a believer of, in Christ is a priest. Young, middle-aged, or older, we are all Christ's royal priests. That's right, we are divinity. So what does a priest do? Well, a priest is a reconciler, a bridge builder, a mediator. Priests pray to God in and through a personal relationship. Priests don't have to experience God through someone else. It's direct. It's personal. Second, priests are ministers, not pastors. Ministers. You are ministers. Every minister is adopted into Christ's royal priesthood, gifted and guided by the Holy Spirit to serve or minister to people who are in need. We are chosen to serve. 
That's how God describes us as his children. Friends, the good news this morning is that in Jesus Christ, God our Heavenly Father adopted us into his family and has given each of us a new identity in Christ. That is amazing good news, a wonderful message to hear at the beginning of a new year. In and through Christ, we are accepted, valued, and gifted to serve people in need. The Apostle John writes in his first letter, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. In one of my favorite movies, Cider House Rules, Homer Wells is an orphan who grew up in a Maine orphanage directed by Dr. Wilbur Larch, who is a kind, generous, and loving man. Homer is returned twice by foster parents. The first uh, set of foster parents said he was too quiet. And the second one, second set of parents, abused him. The conditions at the orphanage are meek and bare, but the children are treated with lots of love and respect. They're treated as if They are adopted into a loving family. Well, each night, Dr. Larch grabs a chair and he tells the children a story. And at the end of the story, he closes every night with these words. Good night, you princes of Maine, you kings of New England. One night after Dr. Larch told his story, said those words, and closed the door, one of the young boys in the room asked the question, why does he say those words to us? Homer responded, he wants us to remember that we belong and that we are deeply loved. Friends, at the Lord's table, we are reminded by Christ that in life and in death, we belong to him. And that we are deeply loved. It is he who has brought us out of the darkness of our sin and death into the bright morning light of his amazing grace and love. We are his adopted children. We are chosen. We are accepted. We are valuable. We are his royalty, gifted to serve those in need as his priests. Praise God for his mercy. Praise God for his love. Let us pray. We do praise you, O Lord, for your great mercy and love in choosing us, that we may belong to you, for accepting us, for making us valuable gifting and guiding us by your Holy Spirit to serve those in need. It is a privilege to be adopted into your family. Lord, now we come to your table, and we are honored. Bless this time that we are together with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.